I could understand why people would get angry if they just believe it down to their core, you know. I think this has to be about, at the end of the day, it has to be about facts, number one. When I say facts, another thing, too, that I would like to consider is where are we getting our facts from? What, what data and what source are we getting these from? And some things are just like logic. The, the video, the only stuff I've honestly, Marcus, that I've ever really looked at when it comes to the moon landings that I've considered where people will look at the live video feed and they'll start analyzing the shadows or how the uh, astronauts are moving or the American flag. Have you looked at any of that stuff and said, well, there's something obviously wrong here as well, too? Or is that just people just trying to pick apart and it's not that important as the other things that you've mentioned? I've watched interminable films discussing both sides of this particular situation. Was it real or was it faked? There are good arguments on both sides. The first person to write about this particular issue, the fabrication of Apollo, was a chap by the name of Bill Casing, who died in 2005. He wrote a book called We Never Went to the Moon. He self-published it because nobody would take it on. And this was 1976. And he uh, laid out a case with some inaccuracies in it, let's put it that way, that Apollo never happened the way we were told. And one of the things he said, well, look, you can see in the photographs, there are no stars in the sky. And there should be because the stars would appear, obviously. But they don't appear in the photographs, therefore they're fake. No, that's not correct. There are stars in the sky, obviously. We can see them even on Earth, through the atmosphere. But they won't appear in a photograph because the photographic film, don't forget this photographic film, not digital. Photographic film is not sufficiently sensitive to record the directly illuminated surface of the moon and the stars in the sky behind them. And that is a correct explanation. So they won't appear. The question then is, well, why didn't the astronauts just point their camera up at the stars, open the shutter for a little bit longer and take a picture of the obviously beautiful canopy of stars above them? But they never did that. They photographed Earth. We've seen the famous Earthrise photographs. But there are no stars in any of the pictures. No, there won't be stars in any of the pictures. This is photographic film. It's not sensitive enough to record the two different levels of illumination. The other point he made was, look, the flag's flapping. Obviously, somebody left the door open in the studio. No, that's ridiculous. Even NASA are not stupid enough to leave a door open. The flag was unfurled, it was carried, allegedly carried to the moon, and it was a, a standard issue, Stars and Stripes, it was about three or four foot long. And in order that it would show as the American flag, which obviously it would be necessary to do, and quite rightly, being proud of it, they wanted to show the American flag. And on Apollo 11, there are several photographs of the American flag being stuck in the ground, and it has a metal tube at the top, which holds it out so it doesn't just fall against the flagpole and look a bit stupid. It's out, but it was folded up and a lot of the creases in the flag still there. And that's why it appears to be flapping. The only time the flag is actually moving is when an astronaut is touching it, twisting it to drive it into the ground. So the flag flaps backwards and forwards. It's not flapping because of the wind, it's flapping because it's being moved. Now, do shadows go in strange angles? In some photographs, you can see that they appear to go in pretty weird angles. There's a photograph from Apollo 17, but the sun is obviously behind the astronaut because you can see his shadow cast forward and it appears in the photograph. But about four or five feet to his right, or to the right of the shadow, is a rock. Just a little rock, about six inches long probably. And that shadow appears to be at right angles to the astronaut's shadow, which wouldn't happen if it was illuminated by the sun, which we're told is the only source of light on the moon. They would converge slightly towards each other because it's a single point from the photograph. It's only one source. We've got two eyes, so we see in stereo. We can see it in a slightly different way. And our brains interpret it for us. If we look at something and we say, well, it's the shadow being cast by the sun. Our brain will tell us, well, that shadow is more or less like uh, looking at a railway line and it goes off into the distance. We know that the railway line is parallel all the way as far as we can see, but it appears to come to a point, And that's what's called the vanishing point. 
I think what I'm wondering is here is that if this is a classified secret run by just a small group of people, I don't know. I think it's hard to keep a secret that big. It just doesn't seem right to me. You know what I mean? Like if this was all fake, if we have never put feet on the moon, somebody would have should have spilled something with the way the internet is now and human nature. I mean, do you think humans can oh, keep a secret like that? It's no secret, but people don't necessarily want to believe it. So they don't accept it. No, it's Stanley Kubrick. He's been mentioned many times as maybe having something to do with uh, filming of Apollo. I personally don't think he was directly involved because he was far too busy working on his masterpiece, 2001 A Space Odyssey, which he was shooting in England, what's now called Boreham Wood Studios, quite close to where he lived. He didn't like flying, he was terrified of flying, so he always worked in the UK, and he did that for about 30 years. There are various little strange coincidences which come up periodically. One of them is his last film, Eyes Wide Shut, because when Stanley Kubrick was working, he had basically total creative control over the film, all the way through to its release. And one of the things he specified on the, for the release of Eyes Wide Shut was that its premiere should be held on July the 16th, 1999, which coincidentally is the 30th anniversary of the alleged launch of Apollo 11. Now, whether that has any bearing or not, or it's just coincidental, I don't think so. He did a lot of that stuff in his movies. He did. There's a website which I can highly recommend to anybody interested in following up on some of this, especially about Stanley Kubrick. This is a website called Aulis, A-U-L-I-S dot com. Aulis dot com. It's been going for about 25 years, this website, and it deals with the Apollo fabrication. And there are articles on it from all over the world, from China, from Russia, from Australia, New Zealand, America, authors who have researched it and put together articles. And one of the articles is about Stanley Kubrick and the coincidences within his films, primarily The Shining with Jack Nicholson and some of the coincidences between 2001 Space Odyssey, Eyes Wide Shut, because Stanley Kubrick was known to be a perfectionist as a filmmaker. And there are several scenes where you see, let's say, a chair in one position, and then in the next scene where the, the same room and the same environment is being filmed, the chair is in a different position, but nobody has touched it. Nobody has seen to touch it. Now, Stanley Kubrick would not allow continuity errors like that unless he deliberately wanted them to occur. Why is something like that happening, where you see one object in an alcove and then in the next scene, when nobody's touched it, you see two objects in the same alcove. Things like that. Very difficult to explain it. Now, we, people have speculated quite often that uh, Stanley Kubrick was using a very new at the time, this is 19, late 1960s for the film 2001, he was using a technique called front screen projection, where he was filming in a studio, as I said, in Boreham Wood, which is north of London. And he was trying to film the Dawn of Man sequence at the beginning of his film 2001, where he shows the apes prancing about. Now, the apes are actors in uh, suits, but the background scene is of Africa, because there aren't any apes in England. Well, not officially, except in zoos. These apes needed to be shown in an African setting. So Stanley Kubrick was using this new technique called front screen projection where he could project the image he wanted to have for the background onto giant screens behind the live action going on in the foreground. And he was the pioneer of this technique. It was used quite extensively up until the time CGI and blue screen came in. But that particular technique, front screen projection, leaves an artifact where you can actually see the join where the screen ends and the live action begins. It's only obvious when you start to look for it. And a lot of people have discovered the same thing on many of the Apollo photographs, where the rather bland mountains in the background appear to have a join where the quite detailed foreground is shown, where the astronauts and the lander and the rover are rushing about. 
if these cameras, the Hasselblad cameras, which took these photographs allegedly, they are so good, or the lenses are so good, that the bland background should not be bland. It should be detailed, and it's not. It's not showing any detail at all. It's just showing a sort of gray mass with a few lumps of rock, maybe. So many people have said, well, Stanley Kubrick used it in 2001. He must have had something to do with Apollo because he's using the same technique. No, it's not a good argument, that one. What you have to look at is who was the special effects director that Stanley Kubrick used, who also did the special effects on Blade Runner, Back to the Future, many of the major special effects that were done at that time were done using models and real studio sets. In Blade Runner, there is a complete city scene, but it's actually a model. And when you see the picture of the model with the, somebody standing in it, it's quite obvious that it is. Back to the Future was filmed using models, miniature trains to push the car, things like that. Now, who was responsible for the special effects on 2001 Blade Runner Back to the Future? It was Douglas Trumbull, who was one of the geniuses of special effects. He used models. This is the late 60s, 1970s. Models were what were used at that time. So were models used on Apollo? The answer is yes, they were. It's quite obvious when you know what to look for. But one of the problems with using models is that they have to look convincing and that perspective has to match what you think you're watching. Many of us have seen the lunar rover. It's called the Grand Prix, where the lunar rover is sort of accelerated up to 12, 15 miles an hour and it bounces around on the lunar surface. But if you look closely at it, you'll see that the astronaut sitting in it doesn't move. His arm does not move. It's as if it's rigidly contained. That's not the way that any human would work. It's a model we're watching, a radio-controlled model. A very good model, but a model nevertheless. Many of the pictures of astronauts, allegedly on the lunar surface, are of models, of mannequins, because in consecutive photographs, which were taken uh, maybe a minute or so apart, they're in precisely the same position from one photograph to the other. The photograph may frame it differently, but if you look at the mannequin astronaut, they're precisely the same. Their arm position is the same, the leg position is the same. It's beautifully done, but they're models. Man, I'm gonna go back and look at this stuff too, because if they're models, that is quite interesting, right? So are you talking about small scale models, like not the astronaut scenes, but all the other photographs, everything are used. They couldn't have been small scale models, like. Everything was done to scale, you think, right? Yeah, like, it was done to scale, and the set was built to scale as well, because it was a stage set. That's why some of these weird shadow angles appear, because if you're lighting it with electric light from fairly close to the set, you will get strange shadow angles, because the, the light is too close. If it's lit by the sun, the shadows will fall parallel to each other or they should fall parallel to you, converging very slightly due to the camera that took the picture. But what we've got are models. They're mannequins. The lunar landers are models. Very good models, but quite a lot of them are taken in the middle distance or the far distance. You can't see very much detail on them. You don't need to see very much detail on them. Some of them are close up, and there's a famous sequence of photographs taken on Apollo 11 as Buzz Aldrin, after whom Buzz Lightyear is named, by the way. As he comes down the ladder, he's photographed by Neil Armstrong, who had cut out and done his one small step for man, one giant leap, etc. He'd done all that. Now he got the camera, and he's taking a photograph of Buzz Aldrin coming down the ladder. There's a sequence of eight photographs showing Buzz Aldrin. You start with his feet coming through the door, then on the top porch, and then three photographs coming down the ladder, and he stands in the foot pad at the bottom. The first one of him on the top of the ladder his feet are not touching the rung. Next time you look at that photograph, look at his right foot. It's not touching the rung of the ladder. His left foot is stuck out at a very stupid angle. So ask yourself this question. If you were just climbing down a ladder after clearing the leaves out of the gutter on the top of your garage roof, you're 10 foot off the ground, would you stick your left foot out at a stupid angle 
when your right foot's not touching the rung of the ladder and hope you're not going to fall off, because if you do, you're going to break something. But Buzz Aldrin is at the top of this ladder, his left foot stuck out, his right foot not touching the rung, and he's lit up like a Christmas tree. He's beautifully illuminated. Where's all that light coming from? Oh, it's the reflection off the lunar surface. Rubbish! It's not anywhere near bright enough to send that amount of reflected light so that it can be photographed by Kodak Ektachrome film, which is what was being used, and the directly illuminated surface of the moon behind the lander is not overexposed. Kodak Ektachrome film has a very low tolerance of exposure latitude. Now you've got to get the exposure perfectly right or you ruin the shot. It's a staged photograph taken here on Earth under controlled conditions by professional photographers using fill-in lights. It's not taken on the moon. It couldn't have been. There isn't enough reflected light. Light.